Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. The phrase in Christ appears 75 times at least in the King James Version of the Bible. And God must consider those words of supreme importance, yet, you know, they're very seldom heard or quoted today. The first occurrence of in Christ is in, the, is in Acts. There's one reference in Acts. But as we begin in the epistles, the first occurrence is in Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And we see the last occurrence in 1 Peter 5.14, where it says, Peace be with you, all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yet we don't hear that phrase mentioned a whole lot today. This video will try and explain just how unique in Christ is, that phrase, and just how unique you are. This is something that I've been wanting to do for, for some time now. Scripture tells us that when Adam sinned, he infected his descendants with a spiritual disease which has plagued the whole species. Some members of, of what we call the human race as, as a result of circumstance or environment, they turn out to exhibit the, the disease, and I'm talking about sin, they, they exhibit that disease more actively and more intensely than others. It's, it's largely a matter of opportunity. And every man is capable of the same outrage, the same sinful passion. It's the, sp the mystery of iniquity, and uh, it's made the whole world a dark world of sin and death. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.7 says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, while some Christians would, would try to convince you and me, you and I, that they would never do some particular act of evil, the truth is that the apparent goodness of man is, well, just apparent only. It really just hinges upon a lack of opportunity to express his or her true self without fear of being found out or punished. People don't want to hear that, but that's the truth of the matter. The truth is that the world lieth in the wicked one. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness, 1 John 5, 17. Its spirit is evil. It hates the light, and it prefers darkness. It basically says away with him when faced with moral perfection. It's fundamentally hostile to goodness and purity. There are none that are truly righteous, Romans 3.10. Only some who are, for one reason or another, less unrighteous than others. In times of war or, or other catastrophe, the real nature of man rises, tends to rise to the surface, and society really reveals what it's been all along. Even the nations in the Bible are likened to wild beasts, creatures that prey upon and, and even crush one another, you know, like the bear, the lion, the eagle, Yet, it isn't animalistic, it's human. The savagery of man, folks, is worse than anything to be found in nature. In fact, it's unfair to the rest of creation to call it beastly. You know, man professes to love truth and integrity, uh, kindness and pity. And in a sense, he does, but, but not when it challenges his own selfish nature. He lives by a double standard and he becomes angry when rightly accused of that double standard. People want to deny the total depravity of man, the fall, 
and, and they'd rather believe that there's something basically or intrinsically good in human nature. It's difficult for many to come to grips with that reality. Man can exercise a keen judgment of right and wrong. I mean, juries can, they can come to, around to, to, to sound and proper decisions. Most men are capable of displaying a, a genuine righteous indignation over wrongs done by others. Uh, especially if the wrong is done to them. Yet the same individuals have a really tough time seeing the wrongness of their own actions or, or attitudes. Or they'll excuse them with anger and violence if they're pointed out. Natural man finds it easier to hate than to love, easier to destroy rather than create. He finds it easier to blame rather than to praise to, or to remember a wrong than to forgive one, to be selfish, than to be generous, to condemn, than to pity. The innocence and the purity of childhood is exchanged for the sinfulness and of, ad of adulthood without fail. Individual history is always downhill by nature. All of history bears that out. It bears out that something, something is wrong with man, you know, he can even, man can even be capable of heroism that seems almost angelic, and on some other occasion of inhuman cruelty that can only be described as demonic. This is not some particular view held by me personally or by this channel. This is not only scriptural, this is history. It's the history of mankind. This is the appalling nature of homo sapiens in general. He's a fallen creature. But now here is where this discussion becomes more interesting, especially as it pertains to you and me. There is another part of this same human race whose motivations have been reoriented, whose nature has been recreated, whose behavior has been radically changed, a people who no longer fear the light, who love the truth, who acknowledge their need of salvation, who seek purity, who thirst after righteousness, who long to be pure and holy, and who hate themselves when they're violent or unjust. A new spirit dwells in them. A holy spirit replaces an unholy spirit. Now, they may feel, they may miserably fail constantly to reach the heights of moral purity that, that they set for themselves. But they no longer ignore it. They no longer excuse it or try to explain it away, make excuses for it. Instead, they cry out as Paul did, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Romans 7, 24. They don't justify themselves. They hate the dark that remains in their souls and they long for the light. They are a new kind of species, a converted species. They are the redeemed of God, the born again, the people in whom the image of God has been recreated. Not recreated as it once was in Adam, like as if we're now all of a sudden we're the same as we were before Adam fell. Oh, no, no, no. That seems to be the common view. That's not true. But recreated and elevated to a position far above what Adam ever knew, experienced, or could imagine. That's the truth of the matter. That's who we are. These two creatures of the human race are at opposite poles. They're antithetical to one another. They dwell together because they're both members of the family of man. But something has happened to cause them to separate into two species within that family of man. And this separation is at a far deeper level than even most professing Christians understand or comprehend. What I want you to know here, folks, is that this is not a symbolic rebirth something achieved by, you know, through uh, some ritual, you know, as it's 
thought to be by some pagan religions, nor does it come about through some process or formula or uh, method or, or ritual ascribed by modern Christianity today. You know, such as do this or that, and if you do, you know, if you do this, and when you do this, you you will miraculously become all of the all that I just described, a new creation in Christ Jesus, at your timing, at according to your will and your timing. And folks, here's my question: Do you honestly think that such an extraordinarily amazing metamorphosis such as this comes about because of something that you did and and at a time of your choosing seriously that's not what the bible teaches that's what most christians today believe but that's not what that book teaches folks i'm doing this video to try to get the point across to you that it, this is a fundamental change in human nature that is so great. It is so great a change that it, it amounts to a person becoming an entirely new species, okay? Something that we have no power to become on our own or become just by willing it to be so or trying and expending so much self-effort to become so. And, and at the time that we want it to occur. Once this change has occurred, there's no going back. That's, that's something else that you need to know. We remain in the world, but we are no longer of the world. I'm putting it up, up on the screen here for you to look at. I know I've talked about these three particular verses in videos past. Born again by the will of God, which includes His timing for that new birth in our lives in a change that becomes as permanent as God Himself. I want you to think about those three indisputable facts. His will, His timing, His faithfulness, our, etern uh, our, our eternal security. Vital truth contained in only three verses. Only three verses. Amazing. So the world continues to love its own, but this newly created species of man, the world hates. John 15, 19. Nor can we ever really escape this, except insofar as we betray our true identity by conduct inappropriate to it, at which point the world may merely change its hatred into despising, which is really far worse. While disobedience brought disaster upon the entire human race, transforming humanity into something other than its original form, a second conversion recovers for all who experience it their true humanity and then some. This is who you are. To be reborn is, in, in a very real sense, to, to recover manhood. Before Adam and Eve fell and, and subjected the entire human race into sin, there existed in the world a species of homo sapiens which differed from the species which we now identify as homo sapiens. The present species which we see in the world today was sinned into being. The original species was, was created. It follows from this, therefore, that after the fall, only those who are redeemed recover their identity as members of the originally created species, Homo sapiens. But it's not just that we go back to the beginning to where we were. It's we go way beyond that or above that, I should say. There are now two distinct species of man walking the face of this earth. Two entirely different species. You want to talk about aliens? There's your aliens. 
And it's us. We're the aliens. Strangers, aliens, pilgrims, sojourners. That is what we are, folks. So every human being belongs either to one or the other of these two species. He can't belong to both. Therefore, as God's redeemed, we now belong to a different body which has a new head, the second Adam, who is Christ. The one species is composed of all who are in Adam and the other all who are in Christ. Seventy-five references to in Christ in the epistles. You rarely see them in the Gospels. Why? 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 Wasn't time yet. The ministry of the of the kingdom to to his people, Israel, the gospel of the kingdom, he had yet to die, suffer and die, raised from the dead. And then came Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. And now we're in Christ. Seventy five references. One in Acts, begins in the epistles, ends in Peter. Now those are the facts. And all of that, just to get to where I began in this video, in Christ, while the history of unredeemed man and Adam unfolds with sorry consequences both for itself and the rest of the created order, the other species, a redeemed and recreated body, is being formed supernaturally by God in Christ as a countermeasure. As natural birth initiates us into the first species, so a supernatural birth takes us out of that species and transfers us into the second species. It is a work of God done by the will of God, not the will of, of the flesh, not the will of man, and it's done at His timing according to Scripture. We had nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. It was not a choice on our part. It was God's choice because we were, are, were members of His family, His household. Wheat that He planted. His sheep who were lost. That's the picture that's given us in Scripture. As natural birth brings us into the world, into that first species in Adam. So our new birth takes us out of that, puts us in Christ. And these two species, whose origin is therefore different and whose destiny is, according to Scripture, is different, coexist side by side as distinct and separate as any other two species. They can't quite successfully uh, unite even though they, you know, mistakenly, they often try to, to do so. They attempt to do so. The one is of this world. The other is not of this world, having been specifically chosen out of it. The difference between the two species is really quite fundamental, which is why I find it shocking that a multitude of professing Christians today would dare suggest that this supernatural work of God in new birth can somehow be undone or made void by something that the Christian does when he never had any, anything to do with it, him becoming a believer in Christ in the first place. We are in Christ. In Christ. And there's not even the slightest hint in Scripture of one being said to have once been in Christ and then now all of a sudden he's or she is not in Christ. Not a single hint. And yet you have armed, you know, I don't know, keyboard warriors on YouTube, you know, claiming to be ministers of the truth of the gospel, claiming left and right that you can, 
lose your salvation by something that you do. I wouldn't even waste my time listening to them. They don't need to be teaching. We are in Christ. We possess a different kind of life. We're actually dealing with two real entities which are at enmity one with the other. Each individual child of God belongs as a cell within within an aggregate of cells, a body of which Christ is the head. It's not a random collection of cells, but a deliberately chosen one, so elected as to form at any moment a viable body, such, such as, as occurred on the first day of Pentecost. That body being a habitation for God in the person of Christ, who as its head directs its life and completes its wholeness even as it completes His. Ephesians 1.23 Which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. That is who we are, folks. That's who we are. Yes, I believe at, at any one moment in history, I believe that that body is complete in the world. Like the human body, every cell that, that has been chosen as a member of it is most likely replaced when it dies in order to preserve the unity of the body. In the early church, it may be that this was an infant body. I believe today the body is nearing the end of its appointed lifespan here on earth in the purposes of God. For none of us lives unto himself. At the same time, the body of Adam is no doubt also maturing and approaching its destined end. The reality of the distinction between these two species is nowhere more clear than in Paul's letter, uh, letters when he warns, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 6.14. In that species of Homo sapiens, which is a new creation in Christ, there will be a desire for association, for fellowship, enjoyment in talking about the Lord, and a concern for the bringing of new members into the family, the family of God. Any child of God whose Christian life is in a normal state of health will seek fellowship with other Christians. He'll, they will enjoy talking with them, about the things of, of the Lord, and they'll be concerned about the matter of personal evangelism. These three will bear a sure testimony to the reality of their being in Christ. In a total absence of those three, those, th those th three things, a complete total absence is a sure sign of their, of their possible membership in Adam. So we got to learn to accept this important fact that we who have been chosen to be members of the blameless family of God because He chose us in Christ are members of, of an entirely different species altogether. It's, it, it is in no way because we were more worthy or less sinful. It is of the same lump that one vessel is made into honor and another for, to dishonor. Romans 9.21 we might seek to enjoy the best of both worlds. Many of you can relate to that, I'm sure. But the latter course will, will only lead to strangeness in both camps and satisfaction nowhere at all. And it is grace and grace alone, the blessed hope that we've been given, that frees us to live as who we truly are in Christ. But Christians today, folks, need to know who they are in Christ. I've said this time and time again. The problem that we're, we're looking at is one of an identity crisis. That is all it is about, folks. If you can talk to your friends and explain to them who they are in Christ, you can't do any better than that. That is what they need to hear. 
because they are suffering from an identity crisis. They don't even know who they are. And when they come to understand who they are, what a change takes place in the life. Christ said that He wouldn't leave us as orphans. You know, a dwelling place for God in Christ has once again been fashioned and the Word becomes flesh once more. This is God's building a spiritual house which with its head, the Lord Jesus Christ, makes one perfect man. As the head, He becomes the Savior of the body, while the body, in some mystical but real way, becomes His own completion. We're not just little Christs running around, okay? But we're part of the single Lord Jesus Christ, bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh, so much a part of Himself that even though now and then our faith fails, He remains forever faithful to complete that work which He began in us. Members of His body recognize one another. The world knows its own. The Christian recognizes his brother. Even the world recognizes this new creation is not of itself. And it, and it feels uncomfortable in its presence, even condemned by it. Yet the two species can work together in harmony in many ways for the common good. The biggest hindrance to such harmony is, well, it's found when members of either species pretend to be what they're not. When the man of the world pretends to be a Christian or the Christian tries to identify with the world. Look, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, rest in Him. And thanks for watching.